we've got essentially three people here. Uh, myself, uh, venture capitalist and startup ecosystem builder. David uh, also works in investment and ecosystem building. And then an actual ecosystem builder with Sergio. So uh, I just want to give you guys a big round of applause because your initiatives around the world are super awesome. Well done, guys. Um, I, before I jump into questions and stuff, let, uh, let me let you add something about your own backgrounds. David, do you want to just say something that I might have overlooked in my one second intro? Sure. Great to see you guys, uh, as always. Um, yeah, just uh, I guess a little background on me, you know, serial entrepreneur, uh, kind of come from that operating side, technical background, uh, turned angel investor. You know, started Techstars in 2007, which is you know now operating um, primarily as accelerators. There, there are 18 of them that run a year in Europe and the U.S. And then, yes, you know, as, as you mentioned, through Startup Weekend, now sort of you know, inspire, hoping to inspire more entrepreneurs around the world to to get educated and go build companies. Um, and then, as you mentioned, also have a, a series of venture capital funds around Techstars today, about about 300 million that we manage. Um, and that's called portfolio. bullet time, right? Um, it used to be. We call it Techstars Ventures now. We decided to take advantage of the brand uh, a little more directly. And, you know, we, we do most of our stuff is, is stuff that comes out of Techstars, but we're also early investors in, in other companies that, you know, weren't in the accelerator, you know, Twilio, Uber, companies like that, but primarily targeted with that capital act companies that come through our accelerators today. Sergio, add some color to your background as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Sergio. I'm one of the global founder institute directors. I'm co-leading the efforts to run the Montreal chapter in Canada. Uh, originally, as you can hear by my accent, I come from Bolivia in South America. And I have been living in Canada for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm a five-time entrepreneur, not long, never launched as a day like a unicorn. But still, I managed to uh, launch two technology-based startups, one in e-commerce and the first mobile payment company in Canada, also some non-tech-related companies, very wide, like a meat packing plant, an office farm, you know, a handicraft manufacturing facility. And you know, right now, I'm also, besides my work in Montreal, I also mentor entrepreneurs in three continents. I mentor for startup accelerator programs such as Momentum Accelerator, Founder Lab, Startup Bootcamp, Angel Hack Accelerator, Startup Peru in Latin America. And for the fun, on weekends, I also facilitate for Startup Weekend in Latin America and Canada. Sure, if you can hear us, but we can't hear you, Adele. You know, no, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. good. All right, sorry about it. We got four topics we're going to cover today. Um, uh, so, first, mentorship what is the importance of startup mentorship? How you can help startups in your community? The types and programs, uh, types of tools and programs you might recommend, and how you can get started as an individual in your community. Let's start with mentorship, right? So, I mean, all three of us have been mentors, right? And, you know, you, you know, so you have experienced mentoring companies. What would, you know, if, if someone's on the call today, and I'm sure there are tons of people on the call today that have mentorship experience, but want to know how to do it better. Um, what were some of the tips that you could give where someone could, get engaged with the community, start mentoring, and have a big impact. Um, we'll just go in sort of uh, right to left. Or why don't, David, do you want to go first and then Sergio? Sure. Um, I actually wrote a blog post about this a while back that's gone around a lot called the Mentor Manifesto, uh, and it talks about how to think about being a mentor. Um, I, I think too, too many people uh, assume that mentor means you're, you're on some kind of pedestal and uh, you're this like you know perfect being that, that 
you know, tells you what to do, tells entrepreneurs what to do. And I think actually, you know, just the opposite is true. I think everyone in a community is a mentor um, and everyone has something to learn, right? And so I may be an expert in, in something and, and Sergio may be an expert in something else. We can teach each other uh, these things. And so I think if everyone gets in the mindset that everyone in the community has to be a mentor, that that is the secret uh, weapon of sustainable entrepreneur, entrepreneurial communities, that there is this culture of helping others with what you know and sort of giving first and getting back uh, as needed from the community. Um, so I think, I think that's very important. Obviously, there are great places to engage uh, you know, through programs like, like we all offer, you know, Startup Weekend, Founder Institute, you know, Techstars, uh, Startup Next, and so on. I mean, there's so many opportunities to engage as a mentor, and, and really it's just about getting out there and, and trying to be helpful with what you know in the community. So you don't have to be some storied, super mega entrepreneur to be a mentor. Pretty, you're saying pretty much anyone can be a mentor. I mean, would you say there's maybe then a difference between, let's say, a manor and an advisor? And then I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Boulder thesis before we jump over to Sergio. Sure. I mean, in, in my parlance, uh, you know, a mentor is someone who gives. Um, they're just trying to be helpful. And there's no expectation of return. It's not transactional. Uh, an advisor, in my language, and we all use different language, it would actually be great to standardize. Uh, if someone is you know, being compensated by the company in some way, um, you know, maybe has some options in the company or whatever. Um, I, I do think, obviously, there are sought-after mentors who have, you know, specific experiences. Um, you know, it, and, and we do, you know, filter the mentors that we allow to engage at different parts of, of the ecosystem that we create, um, just based on, you know, how much they've helped companies and the ratings they've received and what they've actually done. So to be a mentor in a tech stars accelerator, for example, is a higher level than, you know, being a mentor at a startup weekend. It's just the, the amount of um, feedback we get from the companies that, that say how much those people are helpful and we track that and try to get them helpful at the right stages. Um, I, for example, might be a really good mentor at helping companies raise money, right? I've helped lots of companies do that. I'm probably not the best mentor at, you know, how to manage 100 people. Uh, I can tell you something about that, but I'll tell you it's not my expertise. And I think the best mentors understand their strengths and, and weaknesses. What was the second part of your question? Yeah. Oh, the Boulder thesis. You know, why don't we come back to that and let, let okay. because you did it, you, you threw a lot of great stuff out, so we'll come back to Boulder thesis yeah. in a moment. Uh, Sergio, do you want to comment on uh, what David was saying about different types of mentors, advisors, and your thoughts on how people can jump in? Yeah, so um, I think that that's kind of true for some markets. I would say some sophisticated markets. You know, I remember when we started in Montreal in Canada and also in Latin America, you know, I opened Paraguay, I opened Bolivia. So there were no mentors at all. So that kind of mindset to give first to have subject matter experts with tech startups, we're very few of them. And all of that, all the people the community were asking the same kind of questions to those five to ten people. So you need to build that kind of layer, you know, of, of, of first entrepreneurs. And if in your community you don't have that layer, that's a big challenge. So the way we solved that was to appeal to the diaspora. The expats. So, in the case of what are the Bolivian expats, what are Paraguayan expats, the Canadian expats. Sorry, my daughter came in. Um, so that was the first, uh, the first, the first step. You know, appeal to, to the expats to build that first layer, and then, as, as David said, uh, start with the hackathons. You know, ha have people with subject matter expertise mentor for the first time in hackathons, start the weekend editions, and once they get, you know, some kind of experience, first, second time, third time, then you start, they start moving ahead, and then they are able to mentor real startups, real companies, but that's a big challenge with, like, emerging, emerging economies. Yeah, the first time we um, opened in Colombia, uh, the country of Colombia, we had in Bogota, we invited all of the top CEOs uh, to lunch, and they had never met one another before. So, you know, not only were they not mentoring, they really didn't even ever physically, they knew one another because they were written about in magazine articles or newspapers, so they knew of one another, but they had never actually physically met. So that's a good point that some, in some ecosystems you actually need to physically introduce people to the concept of mentoring 
which is a good segue into the Boulder thesis, right? So Boulder, David, is not like a big city with like tons of uh, technology companies, and, and you have transformed it into a, a thriving startup hub. And maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. And while he does, if you have questions, please uh, let our team know and we'll try and get them answered. Right now, again, we're, we're focused on mentorship, but please ask any questions in the audience as well. David, on the Boulder thesis? Yeah, thanks. So, so uh, you know, I, I think that the most definitive work on, on startup communities and what it takes to build them over time, I think that's what the people who are on this, on this uh, webinar are kind of interested in, is how do I make my community better? And, you know, that was why I started, you know, Techstars in 2006. It was, I want to do angel investing better, but really, I want Boulder to be much better than it is. And and I don't say, you know, we're trying to build the next Silicon Valley. That's silly. We're 100,000 people. We're, we're not, not going to be Silicon Valley, right? We're going to be the best Boulder we can be, right? And for those that don't know Boulder, it's a, it's a small town in Colorado. Um, it, it depends on the month you look, but either number four or five in the country in, in venture capital now, right? Uh, most of that flowing into the little city of Boulder, not the big city of Denver. Um, in the IT and, and, and software space, so and that's what we're focused on. So, in this book that Brad Feld wrote uh, called Startup Communities, it, he lays out something that he calls the Boulder Thesis, which is simply observing over a 20-year period how Boulder went from, you know, a place that you know people would say, well, you can't do a startup there, to a place that people say, oh yeah, you know, we know lots of people there, and we understand that you know good companies are built there, and we have companies going public, right? I mean, it's it's obviously very vibrant now, and and. And people use it as a bit of a case study because they know they can't be Silicon Valley, right? Uh, but perhaps they could be like Boulder, right? And, and so we tried to help them understand what had happened here. And there are kind of four components to this Boulder thesis. So I'll give you the cliff notes to the book. Um, but essentially that you have the idea you just said for everyone's benefit, just that it's Brad Feld and the book yeah. is? Startup Communities. Okay, so if, yeah. if, if you, this is a great, you know, we've read it, we have copies here, it's definitely an excellent thing. So, so cliff note it quickly and... Uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the idea is this kind of four central points to this thesis of how to build up a startup community, and obviously the book goes into much more detail, but, um, you know, there, there are two types of people in the community, that's the first concept, there are leaders and feeders. Uh, the leaders primarily have to be the entrepreneurs. So as an example in Boulder, when I started Techstars, it was entrepreneurial. I wasn't a VC. I was uh, not a government agency. I was an entrepreneur, entrepreneur trying to do something to, to help uh, you know, other entrepreneurs at a meta level. You then have the feeders, who are people like um, government agencies, universities, capital providers, right, that, that can help the leaders, right, need to support the activities they're doing by funding them or whatever. But if you want to create a better startup community, the central point here is don't go create a government agency. Go get the entrepreneurs doing stuff, right, and then support what they're doing. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point of the Boulder thesis is take a long-term view. It's going to take 20 years from today to make it better. And so if you ask me how, how long am I going to keep working on the, the Boulder community, it's 20 years from now, right? It's been 20 years since the first time I've ever thought about it. It's not going to happen in a couple, a couple of years. Um, so do things that will have impact 20 years from now or 10 years from now. That'll help. Um, third, you have to have a philosophy of inclusiveness. You have to enable people to engage in the startup community through different mechanisms. We're talking here about the mentorship mechanism. But if I'm an entrepreneur that, you know, or a would-be entrepreneur, I have to have ways like the things that we all provide to, to engage as well. If I want to become uh, a new venture firm, I, I'll sign up to teach them how to do it. Right? even though they're going to be a competitor of mine. And so um, inclusiveness is very key. And finally, fourth, um, you have to have substantive activities that engage the entire the entrepreneurial stack. Um, things like accelerators, right? things like Founder Institute that allow both the entrepreneurs, the service providers, the mentors, and the investors to engage together, right? And rather than cocktail parties where you, you know, they hand out awards, that's not real engagement, right? We want to work on companies together. We want to build things together. So engaging that whole stack is the fourth piece. All right. So you t two of your last points were, you know, inclusive and engagement. And Siddharth is asking from India. You know, some countries like India 
um, people are more competitive than collaborative. And I see this all the time. I see it in Spain. I see it in, <clears throat> and it's sad, right? You literally see like two people trying to have startups like with knives at each other's throats. And you're thinking, you know, why aren't, and, and I mean, Sergio, maybe we'll give you a shot on this one because I know you've seen it in Montreal too. Uh, there, there's a lot of places where, you know, they're the same goal, working in the same city or country, and, and all they want to do is, is take down the other guy rather than uh, help, and, and the rising tide floats all boats. It's sort of a zero, it's called a zero-sum game mentality where there's a finite number of resources. So if you take half of them, then there's only half left for everyone else. If you take 75%, there's 25%. What David's talking about is a non-zero-sum game theory where the more people that help, the bigger the market gets. So, Sergio, do you want to jump in on that a little bit? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's part of, like, growing the ecosystem for the first time, you know? We always talk about being a first-time entrepreneur, but nobody talks about, like, being a first-time mentor. There's no guideline how to be a mentor, you know, to build your community. And for the same thing, there's no kind of a first-time startup community leader or a first-time government trying to build a community. So, you know, people try to uh, implement policies, people try to implement programs, and, you know, when they see a competitive program arriving to the, to the market, they are afraid. They're afraid of competition. They're afraid of losing, you know, the edge or the power to control the community, and then because of that fear, maybe they are they are scared, you know? Well, governments are super competitive. You know, if Startup Chile comes out, then, like, Startup Colombia has to come out. If, like, then Startup Peru has to come out. It's like, and they and they definitely do not collaborate. <laughs> you know, they're, that's funny. You're, you're, it's not just the... The programs, it's the governments, it's it's even the even the, the entrepreneurs themselves are super competitive. Do you want to add anything on that, David? Like how do you break the log jam of this zero sum game thinking at, at every level in some of these new ecosystems? Yeah, and, and you know, as we start to operate in more places around the world, we, we see the same phenomenon, right? It, I think the mistake is that the, these government agencies think they're the leaders and they're actually the feeders. Um, you know, I think it's it's fine, it's good. It's a good activity, but if they're not going to fund companies that are interesting who go on to build the community over a long period of time, it's, it's just spending money and, you know, it, it doesn't amount to a great startup community. Um, I think, you know, Startup Chile has been an, an excellent example of this. A lot of money poured in, probably some good results, but also a lot of startup tourism going on where people go there for the money and then bounce to wherever they're going next. That's okay. That, that builds connections to the community, but it, it in and of itself is not the answer. Um, we have to support the entrepreneurs. And, and as far as the, the, the zero to 60 problem of getting the mentorship community off the ground, uh, there are always going to be entrepreneurs. That's the easy part, right? People who want to go change the world and, and do stuff. Uh, not having uh, mentorship and capital, right, uh, which are tied closely together, can be a, a, a big limiter for the community over time. So how do you get that going? And I think the answer is, uh, once again, like many things in entrepreneurship, counterintuitive. Um, you, you need to get people from your community embedded in communities that are already working. And meaning people need to go and participate in Silicon Valley or Boulder or New York or you know London or wherever where it is working. They need to experience how they're how people in the community give first to them. How they just help and don't ask for anything. They provide mentorship. They don't view it as a zero sum game and that is a big part of why it works. In turn those entrepreneurs will become experienced and successful. Right? and they will go home, right? And so this idea that we only want to fund people that are here, even though we have no mentorship and not much capital, to me is silly. Like, let's, let's fund people no matter where they are that have ties to here so that they'll ultimately come back and know how to provide mentorship the right way, know how to build a startup community because they've experienced it. So I think that's a way to jumpstart it that, that many countries and locations don't recognize. Well, let me, let me comment on that a little bit. So our, our view on that is somewhat similar, in fact, substantively similar, but a little different. Let me explain. So in a lot of these countries, and, say, and we do this all the time, we're in Afghanistan, 
were in uh, you name a, a a place that you would not think we would be and we're probably there if, if you don't have companies you can't have capital if you don't have companies if you have good companies then it's easier to find capital than it is easier to find mentors and, and you're exactly right about the level of sophistication our view there is that you know we'll fly in and uh, people so rather but I think your idea is equally good if not better which is take the people out as well so you know it's an in out right you have to put some people in to, to sort of inject the expertise but then you also have to take some people out and train them remotely plus we also try to train the ecosystem leaders but but it doesn't if there's a fundamental zero-sum game mentality in the market you can train the ecosystem leaders all you want and they're still buttressing against a, a hostile operating environment nonetheless um, Minaz asked a question as well and for those of you who have questions we're going to be moving on in a moment to helping startups in your community but Minaz has a, has a question about uh, mentorship you can ask questions in the questions tab on your dashboard uh, how to incentivize mentors to ensure they keep coming back um, we gave Sergio the last time so David do you want to take the mentor incentive question I'll take a stab at that one too why don't you go first David another another very counterintuitive thing um, I, well, I, you I, talk about the difference between mentors and advisors, right? Yeah. So obviously, I, advisors are compensated, right? But, but you do if you adopt my language. But I, I don't know that everyone uses the same language. But you know, we're talking about people. How do you incentivize people to give uh, their time? You know, if I'm a successful entrepreneur uh, and I've made a bunch of money, I have a couple of choices, right? I can go sail around on my yacht, you know, and and I don't have a yacht by the way, but I could uh, go sail around on my yacht, right? I could just hang out and you know snorkel and sit on the beach, or uh, I could try to give back and help my community and keep my brain engaged and think of it as investing activity in one way or the other, right? Um, I, I think you know many successful entrepreneurs want to mentor, right? They 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 ultimately want to give back. The, the question is, how do you incentivize them to do it? To me, feels a little backwards because the best ones don't care about that as a transactional thing. They want something like that's human nature. They want something, but for many of them, you'd be very surprised what they actually want. Uh, do they want to be paid? Uh, sure, maybe. But again, if they've done really well, does that change their life at the level that you're going to pay them? Probably not. Um, it's the ones that need to be paid that probably aren't the best mentors right? Yeah. Right? in many cases. So. Um, I think that's uh, actually wait, can we just stop on that yeah. for a moment I would say that that's actually a very good litmus test if someone is a good mentor or not if they're like very transactional like I need equity I need to get paid it's probably yeah. not a good sign right and so you know I remember building the initial mentor set here in Boulder you know 2007 I had a hundred meetings I think one person said what's in it for me and I said, hey, you got this free lunch, and you know, I bought you lunch. And that's it. I don't need anything. And I'm just done with that person, right? And no one else asked me that question. But they, they of course, being human, do want something. It's just not financial, and it's not direct. What they want is engagement with other high-quality people, right? Everybody wants that. I can, I can learn from the other mentors. I can learn from these amazing entrepreneurs. They want to learn in general, right? This is a great way to keep my brain engaged, and I have fun with this, right? And that's why I mentor. Um, I, I also I also yeah. want to filter right like I'm getting bombarded by people who want me to mentor them people like us are providing them a nice filter here are some good companies to mentor so I think that's important yeah so Phil Levin who is the longtime CEO of Evernote literally said in the New York Times article it didn't actually get printed in the article ironically uh, but he said it to me multiple times and in multiple other uh, uh, venues that mentoring has particularly at the Founder Institute but in general has not only made him a better CEO, it allowed Evernote to be the success that it is today because it's that process of thinking about the stuff that you do every day, both in ways to present it to others, but in, in ways to help others that makes you more uh, critical about your own daily activities and ergo better, right? Plus you learn from the other people who are mentoring all the things that David said as well. You know, I'd like to add that, like, look, 
our view on mentorship is exactly as David said. Nine out of ten people that we write offer to be a mentor with no uh, in one email with no comp compensation. Um, but we do give a small piece of every company in the program through a, what we call a bonus pool. And if there is a big payday, so we've had mentors get $50,000 checks for showing up and talking for three and a half hours. And those people, including CEOs of public companies, have told me it is the most amount of money per hour they have ever earned as an entrepreneur, <laughs> which is both, I guess, good and bad. <laughs> I mean, my hourly rate is like $2.50. So, you know, and I've had billion dollar exits. It just means you work a lot of hours. So let, let's move on to the next topic. Um, how can you best help startups in your community? And uh, Sergio, you've been doing this a long, you've been doing this very well for a long time. You know, uh, what, what qualifications must someone have to start being a community leader in your mind? Um, is there something like that you say, oh, uh, I was a community leader because I did this, or is it just the will and the desire? I, th I think that people don't talk much about that. I haven't seen any kind of blog post in TechCrunch or any, any, anywhere else. But Can you move the mic a little closer? If you... the, for, for me, the values are the most important asset for any entrepreneur. So... But coming back to the to the Boulder thesis leader feeder, so this is very important for a startup community leader. If if we don't choose wisely leaders having strong values, saying honesty, integrity, you know, willingness to associate yourself, building trust, sharing information, caring about the local culture, then we will we will kind of fail to build a good startup community because. Those leaders have to share those values to the entrepreneurs, and it, it will bring, you know, smart people together. Like, for example, have strong, like, I, I like to work insane hours. I like to work a lot. So most likely, the, the kind of people that surround me, I ask them to work insane hours. So I create this community. In Paraguay, for example, I have a startup community leader who's a, a big fan of corporate social responsibility, anything that has impact investment. And guess what? Now in Paraguay, we're popping up with startups, all of them having impact investment thesis, which is very much different than the ones that I'm building in Canada. Now that's awesome. What, what do you think about the qualifications point? That was a great point, Sergio. David, do you want to add anything? Sorry about that. I lost my, my mute button there. Um, the qualifications, I mean, look, I think, um, again, different skill sets at different levels. I think um, this mentor manifesto that I put out, right, if, if people think this way, if they're, if they're willing to share the, the benefits of their experience, right, it's not, now you should go do X, but I did X and here's what happened, right? And that's the subtlety. Um, I think those people make the best mentors. And, and people who understand the direct experiences they've had, um, you know, versus, uh, you know, I, I just want to comment on everything and tell you how you should do everything, right? These, these people shouldn't be running the companies. Their attitude should be, you know, I'm going to share my experiences, give you some data points, and hopefully the, the, what they're sharing comes from actual experiences. I think often we see mentors who are just sharing their opinion but haven't done the thing. And I, as a mentor, I say I don't know all the time. Right? I don't know, but I know somebody that does know. All right, let me go get this person. I think that's a key trait of the best This isn't just mentors. This is also the leaders themselves. So, so I, I would say there's a lot, which is an interesting question in and of itself. Do you think startup ecosystem leaders need to have the capacity to be a mentor? Or is there, in fact, a difference uh, well, between the two? Yeah, I mean, so, so I guess people would say I'm one of those people in Boulder. Or, I mean, you know. I was an entrepreneur when I started trying to do this. Now I say, well, other people are the leaders. I'm just helping them be successful, right? Um, I think uh, I have learned much more about how to be a good mentor by doing it over a long period of time and having you know, 700 portfolio companies and you know, all this activity, right? Um, I had three of my own startups, but I've had hundreds of other people's startups, right, that have now engaged either at the board level or as an investor. Um, and so I think you can certainly get better over time. It's not like you have to get, you know, here's the threshold. 
for you to engage. You should not engage until you hit this threshold. I don't think that's the right model. I think it's try to be helpful with the things that you can be helpful with. All right, I was angel investing. That, that's helpful, I hope. Um, I wasn't, you know, going around telling everybody you have to do this, you have to do that. I was just trying to be helpful with whatever they needed help with. Over time, I, I learn, you know, patterns. I see patterns and, and pattern matching, and, and I can be a little more aggressive and a little more, um, you know, confident in the advice I'm getting, giving. And today I'm very confident in, in a lot of the advice I'm giving, right? Or I know who the right expert is. So I think you evolve as a leader uh, in a community, and I think everybody who, you know, would like to engage should engage at the right level at the right time. Right. So, I mean, back to the point, you know, I would say your your thesis is, hey, anyone can do it, right? But you got to start somewhere and start with the skills that you have. Sergio says, you know, you should have good values, right? Like, and, and you need to be re very reflective about what those are. And I would add, I would add a third point that if you want to really start organizing and getting involved in the startup community, you know, really the two values that I would say are probably top of the list in my view are honesty and integrity, right? Because it, you need to be honest with these companies. And I, I wrote a, a article in Forbes recently. You know, if you're if you're just like, oh man, great job, great job, and they're not doing a great job, that doesn't really help anybody. It doesn't help them, doesn't help you, doesn't help the startup ecosystem, and you're just you know patting them on their back as they walk off a plank, right? And then the uh, the integrity part is, you know, if you're you say, oh no, I just want to help, but secretly you have this desire to squirrel away some equity or something like that, that's not good either because the leadership, a lot of people look to the leader, as Sergio was saying with the social impact uh, group, the, 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 the values of the leader to get uh, instilled in the community. So if you don't have a fundamental integrity in what you're doing and a fundamental integrity to who you are, and of course I believe most people do, uh, then you know, you're, you're going to poison the well of your startup ecosystem. Um, Ryan asked a question from the audience here. How do you balance the amount of time you give to the community without neglecting your own company if you're working on an early stage or a startup yourself, right? So, you know, if you want to help your startup ecosystem and you're a CEO, how do you do that without that? And, and David, myself, and Sergio, we all have lots of experience there. Um, raise your hand if you want to take that one. Uh, Sergio, David, David, you want to go? Go. Sure. I mean, I, I, look, one of the things we tell all of our uh, portfolio CEOs is you, know, you ought to be on another board. You ought to be engaging in the community. And, and of course, you're trying to balance that. Maybe you have investors, right? They, they don't want you spending half your time you know, out there helping other companies. But the smart ones want you spending some of your time because of the learning we talked about earlier. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't learn something from you know, one of these you know, early startups or one of the mentors. Me Right? Like it's, it's just amazing learning and you can take it back to your own company. So I don't know, I would say rule of thumb, you know, at least 10%, right? I mean, a lot of people do a lot more, but if you're focused fully on something, you know, take 10% of that time and, and give it back to the community. And, and we all know that we're not at 100%, we're at 130%. So you're only going down to 120, right? Think about it that way. Yeah. Um, they, uh, we come back for, for the leader and, and continue for, for that question. You know, Gandhi used to say, a good leader creates new leaders, not followers. That's a kind of like a distinction. And there's a lot of people that think that they will be the king of the place, of the ecosystem. So that's a big mistake. So the kind of approach that I had in Montreal and the places where I used to travel for a sort of weekend, the message is very clear. I told them, okay, now you're trained. You're a leader, but your main mission, or as a mentor, as an entrepreneur, as a startup leader, is to recruit new people that will do exactly the same job that you're doing right now. So that's, for me, a good component to start uh, for, for that community. Uh, what was the second question? The oh, no, Josh was asking, like, what percentage of the time running a startup should you dedicate to helping the ecosystem? Or how do you, you know, balance running a startup and helping? So, you know, uh, you don't need like to spend like, a, I don't know, 
10 hours per day, usually like office hours when you're mentoring entrepreneurs, sometimes like 15 minutes. If you are brutally honest with entrepreneur and you go on deep dive, 15 minutes is like way too much time to help an entrepreneur. So you can say yeah. you can spend like three hours per week to start, count the number of entrepreneurs that you could be mentoring. So it's, it's, huge it's enormous so you have to have the willingness to, to do that step right and i think that you had to say the good the good point to saying i find too many nice mentors that can spend like an hour two hour long coffee meeting saying you're the nice entrepreneur you're doing nice you're the nice but you're not helping them no it's it's better to have less five minutes say, you know, I don't like this, this, this in your strategy, in your project, in whatever thing you're building in your company, the value proposition, get back to work, you know, the mid, the 10 minute meeting is over, come back next week or in three days and come back with a new solution. I'm going to spend more time with you. I, I meant my average meeting, not the average length of my meeting. The average length of my meeting is probably like 28 minutes. But my average meeting, the normal meetings that I have, are 15 minutes long. Because if you, because you, you, if you dispense with the pleasantries and dive right in, you can get anything you want done in 15 minutes. I've done like multi-million dollar business deals in 15 minutes. I've helped startups raise, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in 15 minutes. So if you can't do it in 15 minutes. Uh, now I don't think maybe you start at 15 minutes. That's like um, maybe you start at. 30 minutes, but bear it down. Um, let's move on to, you know, tools. And again, if you've got questions in the audience, uh, don't be shy. There's a questions tab. I've got a team monitoring and uh, we're here to help. So what tools and resources should you utilize as a community leader? So again, I'm um, thinking of now, uh, you know, I want to mentor, I want to lead uh, the ecosystem. I'm going to take some time from my busy startup, 10% of my time, a few hours a week. Uh, now, what are some of the things that, that I can do today or get involved in today or help today? Um, and, and, you know, so you, obviously you've got things like we can start with programs maybe to get, get going. Do you want to do, I mean, obviously, and, you know, Startup Weekend is a great one. Uh, maybe we, each of you could... And, and David, you have a little more experience, and so, so we'll go David Sergio, and then I'll round it out. But how do you see the segmentation of programs in the startup ecosystem today? Yeah. So, so, you know, having seen so many communities, I mean, recognize that they're all in different stages of development. They all have, you know, some pieces in place and not other pieces. Um, you know, I think the first thing is recognize that you're probably not alone. Uh, you're someone that wants to make this community better. Right? So recognize that that's probably not an original thought. Um, there's probably somebody else in the city or location that you're in that's thinking the same way. In fact, they're probably already doing stuff. And so the first step to me is go find those people. Right? Go find the others in the community that are contributing time and effort. They're probably meeting. Uh, they're probably, uh, in some cases, there's at least a few people that are connected and thinking about this. And I, I would try to organize that group of people. If there's not a regular, consistent rhythm, in that group, create one, right? Because that's that's incredibly important to, to organize the leaders. Step yeah. one: organize the leaders. If it's already organized, join it. Don't create a new thing, right? Um, Can I ask a question on that before we jump off? <clears throat> I agree with that a hundred percent. Is this like? Do you see this as a Facebook group, an email list? I mean, what would you do? What What would be the mechanism to communicate with the uh, leaders? Ideally, there's some kind of you know online communication channel could be an email list or something. But it ha I think face to face, you know, I agree. Quarterly, hopefully, you know, a little more frequently. Um, here in Colorado, we have a group called Startup Colorado. Um, people from every city in Colorado come. We do it in different cities. You know, we're we're thinking of it as a statewide ecosystem now because we have good communities that are local. Um, but, but can I? Can I? Can I? Add, let me. I don't mean to interrupt you, but let me go back. I mean. That's a very advanced view, right? We just talked about a couple questions ago, like, oh, screw them, they're, they, they're competing. You know, how do you over, so I agree with organizing leaders, and we've even tried to do this. I know that Up Global tried to do this as well and failed. Yeah. We tried to do it and failed. We're like, Up Global, they, you know, they must have done it badly. 
And then we tried to do it, and we failed. Oh, so, think, you know, so people just don't want to meet, right? That's right. Like, and he's and that's fine. Remember who the leaders are. They're the entrepreneurs, right? We're simply a convener. We're not the leader, right, in my view. So the, you're not saying organize the feeders in your terminology. You're talking about the leader. Let's get the people together who care about this, right, who are the entrepreneurs who are doing stuff, right, who aren't, you know, the government agency. Like, it's fine that they come and participate, but let's not let them take it over, right? Let's, let's have the individual people who are the entrepreneurs help us understand what's in place, what's missing. In a lot of communities, there's an awful lot missing. And then have people stick their hand up, right? I stuck my hand up here and I said, we're not teaching enough uh, middle school students about entrepreneurship. They've never heard of it when they get to college, right? I started going into middle schools. No one else was doing that. I didn't go do the same thing that other entrepreneurs were doing, right? And so just, it's not about, it's not a committee and it's not someone's appointed president of the, you know, the leadership council, right? It's just, what are you guys doing? What am I doing? What could she do? How, how do we all contribute in ways that help Build up the community and understand so what's going on. Sort of Facebook group, email list, organize the entrepreneurs that really want to help. If the feeders, so to speak, the people who want to show up, great. Um, do you want to ask? Uh, you, we use Meetup, by the way, uh, as a very effective tool for for a lot of that. And make sure they try and get together. Um, you know. One of the other things we do, by the way, and, and didn't mean to cut you off, is we create something called the Startup Ecosystem Canvas, which you've uh, highlighted in the past, which sort of outlines all the different feeder groups. Uh, you can go see it at fi.co slash canvas. Um, after you get them together, um, what's step two? Well, understand what's there, right? Use, use something like the canvas, right? Understand what's there. Uh, ask for people to go attack things, right? We need uh, more bridges to places that have cap. We need someone to build relationships with venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, right? That would really help. And someone says, I could do that, right? I know a few, right? And they start going out and doing that. It, it's, it's just entrepreneurs do stuff. That's why they should be the leaders. They don't right. just talk about stuff, right? They, they, the government will say, oh, I'm the organizer, I'm the leader, I put you on a room and I give you assignments and all the entrepreneurs go, eh, right? That, that's not what they want to hear. Right? They, they just want to go do something they're interested in. So give them the forum to kind of pick stuff to go attack. And right. it, well, well, let, let, me, let me add something on that. Maybe I'll be more structured and then get your views. So I sort of, I, I agree with that 100%, but I sort of see like startup weekend type pro. Well, so you've startup, let me even use instead of programs, codes and or descriptors and then I'll put the programs in them so you've got like pre idea which is people who want uh, thinking about something maybe starting a company but they don't have an idea yet in that group you've got um, startup uh, digest for events startup weekend as an event uh, you got startup grind as another event then you've got, all right, now I'm inspired, but I don't know what to do. And there you've got something like the Founder Institute, which can take people who have somewhat of an idea, but not much else. Then after that, you've got, okay, so, so call that idea stage. Then after the idea stage, you've got the, the sort of getting organized and initial growth stage. There you've got Startup Next, which is a great program by Up Global to help uh, people get into accelerators and incubators. Then you've got an incubator and accelerator stage, and it's, it's no doubt in, in my mind that Techstars is probably, you know, if not number one, uh, you know, fighting neck and neck to be number one in that space. So you've got the global leaders like Techstars, and there are tons of local ones popping up all around as well. And I would recommend that if a company is in that type of acceleration or incubation phase, and that's really sort of, I have a company, I have a product, but I need to uh, go to a finishing school to get ready for a launch or, or funding, uh, you know, apply to both the best ones in the world, like Techstars, and apply to some local ones, too. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. After acceleration, you've got the angel level, right? And correct, you can just... just Memory, come back and fix me if I get anything wrong. 
um, there, they're local angel groups, local angels, rich people. <laughs> you know, anyone with money has the potential of being an angel. So, um, and then after that, you have the venture capitalists usually come in. There's some seed state. Venture capitalists are now, and all this is like outliney, and there's a lot more subtlety to it. But there are seed stage venture capitalists, later stage venture capitalists, Series A. So there's a lot of specialization in there. But after angels, usually there's some sort of venture round. And if you get that far, <laughs> then, you know, there's after that, there's like later stage growth equity and IPOs. But, you know, I think for now we can stay to the venture level. Uh, uh, Sergio or David, did, did I characterize that to sort of inspiration, idea, post-idea, incubation, angel, and venture. Am I missing any big categories there? No. Just just to add a deal on the community part, uh, you know, especially for the audience or people in India or emerging countries, you know, the first step will be to go for some kind of startup drinks event, you know, socialize with entrepreneurs, socialize to right. know, to get to know people. And if you don't have, and, and it's like a- That's a, what they would say. Yeah. The first the good yeah. thing, there, there, there's a good program called Startup Genome that we use in Montreal in our communities two, three years ago. So actually to map the community, you know, use a map and start mapping who has been an entrepreneur, launch a company, what's the stage, what's the amount of funding. And then once you have this perspective on the map of what kind of resources you have, what kind of working facilities, you know, and then you can start picking, okay, I want these entrepreneurs, I want to invite these people, I want to do this kind of meetup, organize a, I know, a tour visit to this company. And then, you know, start, yeah. What I was going to say is Dave, uh, David's point was very interesting there. A lot of times if you, in our experience, if you invite the feeders, they're competitive. But if you invite the entrepreneurs, that's the, that's a really smart lesson. I mean, I'm going to walk away. From, I learned something today. So you learn things every day. I actually learned a lot today, but that's a big one. Do you agree with that, Sergio? Yes. Let's go. I want to. We got a few minutes left, so I want to. So, so now I got. We got a lot of people on the video conference today who are okay. What's the next step for me? Right. And we talked a little bit about organizing drinks, uh, getting started. And if you've got other uh, questions for us guys, don't be don't be shy. Um, one thing from Josh is asks, hey, uh, I'm thinking as a first step to start a founder, co-founder meetup in my community. Uh, is that a good idea? So maybe we'll start with Josh's quote and then jump into like, how else might you get started? So Josh wants to start with a co-founder thing. Uh, David, do you want to add thoughts? Co-founder is a good place to start in your community? It, it, it's a thing that an entrepreneur might be interested in that they want to go start. And, and yeah, I've there's one here, it's a monthly meetup, and it's great. And people do meet co-founders, and they do start companies together. It's just a example, an example of a thing you can go do. I've had people come and say, I want to do something for the startup community. I'm like, great. You know, in my view, you know, here's the 10 things that we need, and they pick one. right? I, I said to somebody, we, we need more like meetups for like Ruby or Python or whatever. Like, why don't you go create one of those? And they did it, and it's now this vibrant thing. Right, so it, it leverage what people are actually interested in. So I'd say if you are interested in the co-founder thing, go do it. Right, if you're not interested, don't go do it. Well, do you think? But to your earlier point, David, what happens? You know, maybe there isn't a need. I mean, that's a tricky one, right? Because if you do a co-founder thing, but startups aren't very hot, so to speak, you might have three people come. That's right. But I guess you're you won't know market. until you do it anyway. You're gonna, so. you're gonna get market data real quick. And you could certainly go, if you're part of this group of people who's thinking about this, you could say, what do you all think? Oh, we tried that a year ago, it wasn't very popular. There might be a, a higher impact thing for you to go do. But you have to mesh that with your own interests. right? It, it's like anything, you're not gonna be good at it unless you love it. Sergio, you wanna add something on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it's, uh, I was, David had a good intervention and a good response on how to approach that. 
I think that if you want to be a startup community leader, you need to have the kind of mindset of a serial entrepreneur. I mean, when I launch an activity or an event in Montreal, I don't expect to run it for 10 years or, or one year. I just do it for the first time. Assemble a team, you guys, okay, want to do a startup weekend? Okay, let's do it for the first time. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And the second time, there has to be people coming up. Let's bring startup grind. Okay, great. Just did it once. Let's bring Mobile Monday once. And then you get involved for other initiatives and you start building a community. And as, as, as you grow, you will find, as David mentioned, people that are strongly passionate about the co-founders things who will be leading that effort. But you need to become kind of like an empathy to any kind of activity popping up in your community. You need to be some kind of solidarity. Okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you my hand. And then the community will grow and then suddenly... You know, in Montreal, two years ago, we had five, five community events per year. Now we have like close to 200. It's insane. I love uh, this point Sergio is making. I mean, uh, I started Open Angel Forum here, right? I don't run it anymore. I handed it off to somebody else. They run it. They love it, right? But I lent my name to it early on. And I still come and attend. But now it's this vibrant thing that's on its own. It doesn't cost me any time. But I help make it happen here. Oh, that's great. Well, Nathan asked a question, and this is probably relevant more to you and me, David, um, but he's struggling with, in his community, the investment side, you know, and, and, you know, he's saying that investors, accelerators, and institutions only release money to the high potential startups, and, you know, it, as a result, he feels like there's some good companies that get excluded, and this popularity with unicorns and i don't have a unicorn within reach but you know there's this like unicorn mentality is taken over almost every investor in the world and you know if they don't think you're a unicorn you're basically quote unquote shit out of luck uh in getting money so is there is there any way to fix that i mean this is this is nathan's question is there any way to fix that to get more people engaged in helping different kinds of startups or is it a is it a hopeless endeavor yeah well first i'd say welcome to the global uh, startup community uh that problem exists in every community that you'll find plenty of entrepreneurs in san francisco where there's the most venture capital saying gee there's not enough capital uh right especially yeah. for the kind of thing i'm doing right um i'd encourage this company the way, every company if you ask elon musk does he have enough money he will no. say no if you ask Jeff Bezos, does he have enough money? He will say no. It's like the, the yeah, anyway, sorry, David. So, so welcome welcome to you know, the problem we all have, right? And, and I think the specific nuance of your question is, um, yeah, but there's companies that could be 10, 20, 50 million dollar companies, right? And people are just going, eh, you know, I, I need a unicorn. Well, you know, a couple things. One, they don't actually know if it's going to be a unicorn or not. Uh, plenty of companies that sounded, I mean, Microsoft was started as a thing that measured traffic going across roads, right? And then it was like basic, a programming language. Does this sound like a unicorn? Uh, it's a big unicorn, right? Uh, you just don't know, right? And so I think I think the, the mindset that, you know, it has to look like a unicorn on day one is kind of silly uh, for a lot of investors to even have that mindset. Um, you want to invest in great people that want to change the world and are mission driven. I think that's that's how you create unicorns, right? Um, companies get permission to do more as they grow. I think the second thing is, you know, you can talk about this issue, right? You can say, hey, that's probably for angel investors, and that's probably for angel investors that care about that space, right? I mean, we need more restaurants. You're not going to get venture capitalists funding restaurants very often, right? One off. But you, you have lots of people that want to see more restaurants in their community, want to do crowdfunding, right? They're, I think target the right kind of investor for the right kind of thing would be my response. My fund may pass on a deal that I may do personally because, you know, I have different investment criteria than the fund. So I'm happy to get a 3x to 5x on a, on a personal investment that my fund would feel is too small, right? So, I, I you know, and, and so that's an embodiment. There are different kinds of investors that have different kinds of return profiles that they're perfectly comfortable with. So I don't think there is a one size fits all. You know, I'm not like as a fund and an individual like unicorn, unicorn, unicorn. With that said, though, what I would what I, I would say is that you know if you're looking money 
follows good companies. And David nailed it and quickly in something he said in passing, which is what, what I look for no matter what, whether it's the fund or individually, is it the person, I look at their passion, I look at their commitment, and I look at their vision, right? If they're passionate, committed with a big vision, and again, I'm an early stage investor, so there's not much else to evaluate. I can't look at traction. I can't look at product because usually I don't have either. So I, you know, and, and so you say, hey, it's not working out here because everyone's looking for the unicorn. But at the really early stage, again, you don't know, as David said. So you got to look at the person. Are they passionate? Are they committed? And do they have a big vision? And those are three things that you can mentor and help. And that will open up the investment opportunity. So what I'm going to say to the final thoughts here, guys. So we got we had a decent number of people in, and they're like, I want to help my ecosystem. So maybe like one uh, story from your past and a closing thought for them to inspire them going forward. And we'll go this way from Sergio first. You know, one thing from your past, closing thought, David, and then I'll I'll wind up. Yeah, so just think as a global citizen. Like I'm a global citizen, I speak like five languages. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, but you think it don't, your community doesn't have the necessary funding, or maybe people are funding with low valuations, and you think it's crappy, move away. There are like a thousand accelerators that are funding right now in U.S., Canada. Move away, and. In every kind of country, Latin America, Asia, Europe, there are new accelerators popping up. So, a new angel investors, you know, in Africa, a new VC funds. So, move away. That being said, you have to have an amazing value proposition, an amazing product. And pick my side. I was born in Bolivia, launched a company in Bolivia, and I had to move on to a mobile payment company in Canada. So, be a global citizen. Okay. David, uh, something from your past and a, and a final tip? Yeah, quick quick story. Um, in 2006, when I started Techstars to try to impact the Boulder entrepreneurial community, I had no clue that it would be in you know, 12 locations and you know helping entrepreneurs around the world and being a model for others. Uh, instead, what I did is I said, I want to help, I want to invest, I want to uh, you know, create this mentorship-driven thing that I had in my head. I went to some guy named Brad Feld who I'd never met before, had a 10 minute meeting, told him I wanted to do it. And, you know, seven, eight years later, uh, I, I'm the thing I'm most proud about is the meta impact, right, on, on, on entrepreneurship in general around the world. And I had no idea that that little meeting with Brad Feld would, would you know, sort of change the world of entrepreneurship a little bit and, you know, lead me to venture capital funds. I mean, it was not some grand plan. Nobody in this community knew me seven, eight years ago. Um, take a long-term view is my parting thought, and sometimes it happens much quicker than you expect. Yeah, and from my, my story is not very dissimilar. Um, I started the funded as a reaction to help level the playing field with investors having been uh, taken advantage of as an entrepreneur. And then when I – sorry, there's a police car outside. Then as I was running the funded, I said, wait a minute, this is like helping a certain small subset of entrepreneurs. Really what I want to do is try and help a wider subset. And um, I said, all right, if, if we want to change the fundamental world of entrepreneurship, you got to create a lot of companies that have a much higher degree of survival. So I said, ah, what's a lot of companies? I was like, a thousand companies. And then I'm like, What's a high degree of survival? I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe above 70%. So, so six years later, after that epiphany, if you will, we're creating about 1,700 companies a year in over 100 cities worldwide with an average of 85% survival rate. So, again, you know, like David, a very, you know, you know, long-term view, but kind of cockamamie in some way, big vision. And then all of a sudden, six years later, we're almost double the size and a greater survival rate. And I think we can go a lot further. So what I would say to you guys is, look, um, nothing gets done unless you take the first step, right? And so it's great that you're here today listening in and getting some advice, you know, 
find a meeting of the people in your community like David recommended go out and attend it or if it's not there bring together the entrepreneurs in your market and get started talking with them just about the market itself it could be over drinks or whatever else but take that first step if you don't take the first step it will never get done so with that said big round of applause for our awesome panel thank you guys Woo!